and worshiping together. And there is something about the scriptures that I want to show you today that I think is going to help you become even better worshipers than you are. I believe the Lord wants to show you something in his scripture today and encourage you to continue to develop a lifestyle of worship. Now, before we read the text in Revelation chapter four, let me remind you of what Revelation three says to us. At the end of Revelation three, he's writing to the church of Laodicea and it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock And if anyone hears me, I will enter in to that door and dwell there with you. So in other words, Jesus is giving us an invitation that if we would open our lives up to him, he walks into messy houses. You don't have to clean up your act or get better before Jesus comes. That's what he's saying there. And most people, if you ask them, what is it, what's happening during worship? What's, what is the activity, the spiritual activity that's happening when we worship? Most people will say, well, I'm opening up my life to God. I'm inviting God into my life. And that is absolutely true. There's nothing wrong with believing that. That is a solid, that's a solid answer. It's just an incomplete answer. There's more to worship than us inviting God into our lives. Because Revelation 3 says that, but Revelation 4 is actually an invitation for us to come into the world that God has created. Not just to invite Jesus into our lives, but God's inviting us into some heavenly realms to help. And so Revelation 4 is, shows us the activity of heaven. Revelation 4, now listen, John is on an island in the Mediterranean. He's been sent there by the Roman government because he's considered a threat. So I want you to think about what he's doing every single day. Every day when he wakes up, he is scavenging for food. He's trying to find enough fresh water to stay alive. He's been separated from his family. He's been separated from his friends. He's been separated from his church. He is all alone. And if you've ever seen pictures of the Isle of Patmos, it's not, it's not a luxury resort. It's a, basically a rock sticking up out of the water. There's nothing there. So they sent him there to die. Instead, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, John is caught up into the heavens And he sees visions of heaven unlike anyone's ever seen in all of Scripture. Now, I want to calm your soul a bit. Uh, The book of Revelation is wildly misunderstood. So let me give you some context. The book of Revelation was written to first century Christians living in the Mediterranean. So if what you read in the book of Revelation would not make sense to a first century Christian living in the Mediterranean, it shouldn't make sense to us. So who was it written to? It was written to a group of Christians who were under intense evil persecution and they needed to be reminded that God was all powerful and still in control in spite of the evil that was all around them. So here we are, East Texas, 2023. Would you agree that the world seems to be getting darker? And man, you don't have to agree on everything, but I think we can all agree that what we see happening around us is not getting better, it's getting worse. I think we need to be more reminded now than ever that heaven is not unsettled. That heaven, there's not a panic in heaven about what's going on on the earth. Listen, there's not one sin, there's not one evil being that's happening on the earth today that has not already happened at least once in human history. All of heaven is not unsettled by the activity that's happening around us. What heaven sees is an opportunity for the light to break forth in the darkness. And John was, wrote this letter to the church in the Mediterranean, encouraging them to be light, to be salt, to remember that God was sovereign and in control. Okay, what I'm about to read is, is going to sound odd. It's going to sound bizarre, but it's true. All right, let's read together. Revelation 4, verse 2. He says, at once I was in the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's descending upon him. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. And in surrounding the throne, listen to this, were 24 other thrones. Now, I, know if, I know most of you are public school people like I am. I'm a product of the Louisiana public school system, but 24 plus one is 25. 25 thrones. 
Now, that's important to underline the word throne both times that you see it in this text, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. He says, they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads, and from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder, a lot like what happened last night. I watched that storm roll in. That was a lot of fun. And in front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing, and these are the seven spirits of God. Now look at verse six. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for these texts that are alive, these scriptures that are alive and well. We thank you that these scriptures were given to us by the Holy Spirit, and we receive them today. And I pray that these words would capture us, would challenge us, would shape us and change us. I pray that they would convict us and grow us up. And we ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. If you believe that, say amen. amen. All right, so when I read this text, you notice the word throne kept popping up. In fact, the word throne appears in almost every chapter of the book of Revelation. Now, there, that's really important because when John was caught up in the heavens, he kept seeing a throne. So what is it that John saw? When I read that text to you, there were four things that just jumped off the page at me when I saw this. So what does John see? Let me show you these four things. Number one, he saw something beautiful. Jasper and ruby. He saw something that was beautiful. Life Fellowship, listen, we're living in a world that looks ugly. It looks dark at times. And what happens when we come into worship, we are reminded that we don't serve an awful God. We don't serve a, a, a God that's lacking in beauty. Listen, God is the one that gave us the beautiful sunsets, the mountains, the oceans, the streams, the things that we see are beautiful. We're, we're creations from him. And worship reminds us that we are serving a God of infinite beauty. Do not lose your sense of joy. Don't lose your sense of beauty. It is beauty that captures the human heart. It is the beauty of God, the kindness of God that draws people to him. And listen, I want you to remember today that God has a beautiful heaven and the new heaven and the new earth will be filled with beautiful things. That is your future. That is your hope as you're living for Jesus right now in an ugly world. It is the beauty that will, that, uh, of his creation that will, that will overwhelm and overtake the ugliness of the world. So here's the second thing he saw. He saw strength. There was something strong there. 25 thrones, 24 elders. He saw creatures that we're about to see in a moment. He saw strength in heaven. And that's what happens in worship when you feel weak and you feel helpless. You feel like you're in despair. What happens in worship, you get caught up into his presence and you see something beautiful and you feel the strength of God. How many of you have ever been in a worship environment where you're singing a song <clears throat> where suddenly the, your weakness fell off and you felt the, some, some supernatural strength overtake you? Maybe you walked into the church service and you were tired. Maybe you walked in and you were discouraged, but then something happened. A strength came over you. Where did that strength come from? It came from heaven to the earth on your behalf. So when John gets caught up, John, John listen, John is dehydrated. John is barely, he, he's starving. The, he needed to see something strong. He needed to keep going. Some of you may have walked in today wondering if you could just keep going. And worship brings you into this place where you see something strong, you see something unmove, immovable, unshakable, undeniable. That's what happens when we worship. And then he saw authority. Let me ask you a question. Who sits on thrones? Kings and kingdoms, kings and queens. Those who have authority sit on thrones. And the first thing that he sees when he gets caught up into this vision is he sees a throne. And he says, someone is sitting on it. Now, who was sitting on it? It was God, Father in heaven, Son, Jesus sitting on the throne, Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the saints. He saw authority. It, it, it had strength to it. Listen, that authority is important for us to understand. When, you're pray, when you pray in the name and authority of the Holy Spirit, when you say, I pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, or when I pray in the name of Jesus, why are you praying in the name of Jesus? Because he's sitting on a throne. You're his child. 
You've been adopted by Christ. And so when I pray prayers over my children, I say, Father in heaven, protect them and keep them and grant them strength today. I pray for my wife that she would be, have the peace of the Holy Spirit today. I pray you would surround her with good people. I pray all the prayers that I pray over my family every day. At the end of those prayers, I say, I pray all of this in the name and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that not because he was a good man that taught us good things. I pray that because he has been resurrected and he is now seated on a throne and because he is seated on a throne, he has final authority over my life and your life. Can somebody say amen? So he saw beauty. He saw something with strength. He saw authority, but then he saw peace. Listen, it says that the whole place in front of the throne was like a sea of glass. The other night we were on the Toledo Bend Reservoir and it was one of those rare June nights where there was no wind. So we were sitting just two nights ago on my mom's front porch and there's miles and miles of lake out in front of me and the entire thing was completely calm. I mean, there was no wind. And that was the picture of heaven. Everything is calm. Listen, we're living in a world that tells you to speed up. It tells you to, to, to embrace chaos. Where, where is it that you can take a deep breath? This is the world where it's suffocating at times because of the pace that we're living our lives and the pressure and the tension that we feel. Where is it that you can find real peace? It's in the place of worship where you're caught up into heaven and you realize there's beauty. Yes, there's strength. Yes, there's authority. Yes, but there's peace there. And listen, some of you have not experienced real peace in a while because you've gotten out of the habit of allowing yourself to be caught up into worship. I worship every day. It's not a Sunday thing for me. People ask me, what kind of music do I listen to? I listen to almost all worship music. My life is too, too chaotic and too crazy not to, not to be caught up into worship on a regular basis. Look, some of you guys need to turn off country and western and put back on some worship music. Turn, turn off that, fill your soul with something that's restoring you and refueling you. And I like country music, by the way, because I grew up, my dad said there was only two types of music growing up. He said, Brady, there's two types of music, country and western. So I understand that. I grew up on eight tracks in the, in the pickup. Anybody else have an eight track in the pickup growing up? Everybody under 50, you can Google it, but all of us over 50. So here's three things this morning that I want you to catch. I want you to, I'm so impassioned about this message because I want you to catch this today. But there are three things that I want to show you about worship that I think can change your life. It could really set your whole life on a different trajectory. The, the most mature, godly, anointed people I know are worshipers. The most mature, the most godly, the, the, the people with the purest hearts that I know are all worshipers. And so there's three things I want to show you today. Number one, worship is admitting that we're not in control. And, and it's number one for a reason because this is the most difficult thing for us to understand. Worship is, a t is surrender. Worship is giving our lives over to something that's stronger and bigger and better than ourselves. I want to read this to you, okay? Go back to Revelation 4. I'm going to show you again Let's keep looking again at what John saw in heaven. Revelation 4, verse 6. It says, in the center around the throne, there's that word again, were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes. Now we know this, that these are moms. <laughs> we know that moms are in heaven because of this. Listen to this, and I'm going to give you further evidence. In front and in back. My mom had eyes in the front and the back. She saw everything. I didn't get away with anything in my house. This is mom's. And we know there's some dads up there because the first living creature was like a lion and the second was like an ox. Those are dad bods, by the way. Those are not father figures. Those are dad bods. <laughs> and the third had the face like a man and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Now again, don't try to interpret all this. This is not meant for, to be interpreted or decoded. It was meant to be beautiful. It was meant to capture your imagination. It was meant to bring you to a place of awe and surrender to God. Listen to what he says. He says, each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. Even under its wings, day and night, they never stopped saying, say this with me, holy, 
holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Listen, if you can't think of anything else to say during the day, if you find yourself at a loss for words and you don't know how to come into the presence of the Lord, just start singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You know what that's a reminder? It's a reminder that I'm not in control, that God was faithful yesterday, God will be faithful today, and God will be faithful to me tomorrow. This is not about me being good. It's not about me doing all the right stuff. It's about me, listen, the gospel is not about you being good. The gospel is about you surrendering your life to a God who is always good. That's the good news of the gospel. I don't have to be in control. That is the good news of the gospel is I don't have to be in control of every situation. I can give myself up to a God who is more powerful than me. Listen, I have tried to be God and I'm terrible at it. And the problem with America today is we have 338 million gods trying to make decisions for their lives. Instead of surrendering to the God who is holy, 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 who was and is and is to come. That is the call of the gospel. So here's what, here's what I want you to remember. We worship with a conviction that we're in the presence of God. And failure to worship, listen, this might be the most important thing I say today. Failure to worship leaves us at the mercy of the world's whims and fears. In other words, without worship, we will all live manipulated lives. Let me leave that up just for a moment. I want you to catch this. Now, I notice all you have smartphones and you've been scrolling through your phones since you woke up this morning. Almost all of the information that has appeared on your timeline, on your social media timelines, on your news timelines, the alerts that you're getting, almost all of that is because of a carefully crafted algorithm that's been personally designed for you. Do you know this? Are you aware of the manipulation that's happening with the information you're seeing? So when you see information, it could be political, social, economic, doesn't matter. Whatever information you're seeing on your phone has been given to you because of a carefully crafted algorithm. When you go on Amazon and you start shopping, there are a list of things, things that we suggest for you. And it's almost all stuff that I want to buy. <laughs> right? Because they know me better than my wife knows me. As Pam goes, what do you want for your birthday? I said, go on Amazon, they'll tell you. It's right there. The 12 things that dad wants is right there for Father's Day. You don't have to ask me, ask Amazon. They know my life, right? So Pam and I were in a restaurant and back in the winter, it was so cold, it was snowing, the wind was blowing, we were aggravated, we had a bad attitude. And I said to Pam, I said, I wanna go somewhere that's hot. I mean, like Burmese jungle hot. I wanna go somewhere where you, we sweat. I'm tired of the cold. I said, we should just go to Bermuda or, or we should go somewhere like the Bahamas. I said, the Bahamas sound nice. Let's go to somewhere where it's blistering hot right now. And so we were joking around for two weeks. Every website that I pulled up had a trip, a, a, like a, a discounted trip to the Bahamas. They were listening to me. Listen, this is what's happening. I just want to bring this to your attention. You're being manipulated. Almost all of the information is drawing you toward causes, our people, our products. Listen, one more time. Every bit of information is drawing you toward a cause, toward people, or toward a product that may or may not be for your benefit. This is the world that we're living in in 2023. It wasn't like this 30 years ago, but it's like this today. And I'm just here to tell you that if you don't create and curate a culture of worship in your life, you will look up one day and you have drifted off center. You are headed in a direction that you never thought you were headed. Why? Because something is after your attention. But I have good news for you. The Holy Spirit has a carefully crafted algorithm that's designed for you to flourish. The Holy Spirit is also at work in my life. And so every day I have to wake up and say, who's going to get my primary attention? Is this my screen going to get my primary attention? My scrolling going to get my, or am I going to turn my hands toward heaven and surrender my life to a God who wants me to flourish, who wants the best for me? I serve a Jesus that has already saved me, has already given me the Holy Spirit, and he wants me to flourish. Worship steadies us. Worship gives us purpose 
and worship gives me direction. That's why it's important to worship. And here's the second thing. Worship is a personal decision. When I walked in this morning, I love your church. I've been here many times. I love the people here. I love your pastor. And I knew that when we began to worship, it, it's, this is a genuine environment that loves to worship. So it's not, this is not a hard decision for me this morning. But I'm just saying Monday morning and Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, I have to decide to worship. You don't have, I mean, wouldn't it be great to wake up and you had a world-class worship team in your living room helping you lead worship, right? Just having somebody lead some worship. But listen, on, on Tuesday morning, it's my decision to worship. And worship is a personal decision. Look at Psalm 42. Let me show this to you. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Now, let, no, let's stop here for a moment. How many of you have had a moment this week where you felt downcast or disturbed? You saw something that caused you to be disturbed. This is a, a regular thing that happens in our lives, especially if you're going to spend a lot of time on your screen. You're going to find yourself angry. Some of you have been mad for five years and you don't know why. You're just mad all the time. Everything makes you mad. Why? Because that's, that's the, the design of the algorithm is to keep you aggravated. Because you'll come back to the things that you're aggravated about. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you disturbed within me? Listen to this. Put your hope in God. Listen to this. This next phrase is key, though. For I will yet. You know what he's saying here? He says, in spite of my soul being disturbed, even though I feel downcast, that's actually the very moment where we have to decide to worship. That's, that's when you, that's where the real fight happens. Listen, it's easy to come in on Sunday morning and sing songs and worship. This is easy. This is the training ground for the rest of your week. It is a fight to worship during the week when you don't feel like it. That's the moment you have to decide, I am not going to be manipulated. I'm not going to be distracted. I'm not going to be aggravated. This is when you decide to lift your voice. And listen, you may not, I don't sing very well either, but I'm, I'm happy. I got a joyful noise. I make a joyful noise. It's not a good noise, but it's a joyful noise. I decide to sing out loud. I decide to lift my hands. I decide to, to clap my hands. I decide to bow down and worship. Those are decisions that I make. Because I know, listen, I don't want someone else deciding my emotions for me. I am deciding who I worship. I am deciding that Jesus is king. I've already made up my mind to follow Jesus. So I have to make a decision to worship. Even when I feel downcast, even when I don't feel like it, for I will yet praise the Lord. I'm going to do it in that moment in spite of the way I feel. Here's the last thing I want you to catch. And I do think that what I'm about to say is important for some of you, your families. I've been walking around your building today, and I just felt today there's some of you walking around with heavy hearts about your children. I met a, I met a man at the, after the nine o'clock service, was telling me about his son going through a tough time, and you could just see the look on his face. He's, he's having a hard time with his young adult son. And that, we under, understand that. And it, worship, though, is a prophetic announcement. Worship is declaring something that you want to be real, but is not yet. Worship is declaring something that you know is God's will, but it hasn't happened yet. Now listen to this in Psalm 89. Listen very carefully to this. This is, a, this is the writer is talking about this very thing about declaring something, saying something out loud. He says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. Notice that he is uttering words, singing. He's talking about speaking something. And with my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. Again, he's talking about proclaiming. He's saying something. He says, I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you establish your faithfulness in heaven itself. He's saying the importance of our words. Our words matter. What are you speaking over your marriage right now? What are you speaking over your children? Listen, years and years ago, when my kids were like 10 and 11, they were almost teenagers, but not yet. I can't tell you how many people would come to me and say, well, enjoy them now because they're about to be teenagers. I looked at them and said, why, why are you saying that to me? I said, actually, I think the teenage years with my kids are going to be a lot of fun. Listen, you don't think parenting is a challenge from day one. How many of you have been around two-year-olds lately? 
they're, they're a handful. I mean, that's, that's a problem. And, and so a, a, when a child grows up, there's, there's different challenges at every age group. But I begin to speak over my kids. Their teenage years are going to be fun for their mother. We are going to enjoy watching them grow into adulthood. I speak life. In fact, I wrote the book, Speak Life, for that reason. My kids were just coming into their teenage years when I wrote that book. And I'm telling you, I began to speak life over Abram. I began to prophesy over Callie. And they, they made some mistakes. They had their normal teenage shenanigans and tomfoolery and all that stuff. But listen, we enjoyed them during their teenage years. They're 24 and 22 now. They both just graduated college. They both have jobs. They live away from me. It is amazing. I cried zero tears when they left the house. Not because I don't like them, it's just because I'm proud of them. They flourish, go, come back when you have grandkids, right? Dad, dad doesn't have any more money to give you. Go make your own and bring me grandkids. That's the, that's the deal that we made when you got born. And it's, it's come, listen, speak life. And so your, your teenagers may be knuckleheads right now, but speak life over them. Maybe your marriage is struggling right now. What are you speaking over your marriage? What prophetic pronouncement are you speaking over your relationships right now? Listen, sometimes, here, here's the, here it is. What you're saying when you do that is it will not always be this way. That's, that is one of the most powerful things about worship that most people are missing. Most people say, well, when I feel like it, when, when everything is rainbows and butterflies and puppy dogs, I will then... You know, I'll, I'll, have, I'll be in a good mood, everything's great, my life is working, that's when I'll worship. Actually, that's, that's easy, that's, that's training wheels worship then. The real fight is when your life stinks. When you feel surrounded by darkness, that's when you have to decide to worship. When your kids are misbehaving and your wife doesn't like you, that's when you better learn to worship. This, these are the moments that we're living in today. This is the real stuff that I'm talking about today. This is day-to-day -day grind, the 80% of your life that nobody wants to talk about. It's to get up every morning and fix your kids' breakfast and do dirty laundry and do, go to your job and come back home tired and go to bed kind of day. That's when we have to decide to worship. That's when your life can blossom and begin to flourish. Listen, here's what happens. One day, all things are going to be made new. That is a biblical truth. One day, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And the Bible says Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Listen to this, this is good news. And his kingdom will have no end. So when Jesus taught us to pray, what did he say? Pray that by the Father's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I just read to you Revelation 4 about heaven. And what I read to you was, was a, a picture, an awe-inspiring picture of strength and authority and peace. And, and, and there's something going on in heaven that wants to invade your earthly realm right now. So before Christ returns, is it possible, listen very carefully, is it possible that we can have the kingdom of heaven on earth right now as it is in heaven? I just need two people to say amen and I'll finish this up. The answer is yes. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. Pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when I pray over my children, I say, Father in heaven, I don't see in the earthly realm, I don't see everything coming together the way I thought it would. But Father, you're the one that gave them to me. You're the one that created them in their mother's womb. You're the one that gave them spiritual gifts. So I pray over my children right now, your kingdom come on earth. And when Jesus said on earth, he meant right now, as it is in heaven. You can bring heaven to the earth. You can establish his rule and reign in places of chaos right now. So my question to you is, what part of your life is not working right now? What's not working in your life? What's broken? That's where you need to start speaking life over it. Father, my job stinks. I don't like my boss. I've, I've, I've actually thought of creating a felony against him many times. <laughs> I'd be out of jail by now if I'd want killed him the first time I thought about it. I mean, whatever's broken, whatever's messy, your kingdom come 
on earth, right now in my marriage, right now over my children, right now over my health, right now over anything that's broken. Your kingdom come right now. So when you worship, listen to this, worship allows us to sing about the morning while living at midnight. This is the power, this is the missing element in most people's lives. And I want to tell you, I've told you this story before, but it's a story that it's, it's a part of my life now and I can't move past it for a lot of reasons. But 16 years ago, we had awful violence come on our campus one Sunday morning. A gunman killed two of my teenage girls out in my parking lot, wounded some other people. It was awful. And I was, I was the pastor there for 100 days when it happened. So I was a brand new pastor. Nobody knew me. And I had all this violence break out. It was, it was an awful morning. And I remember that night I was sit, sitting in the back of a police car warming up because I had done this news conference out at the end of my driveway at the church and I didn't bring my jacket and it was cold and snowy and I was freezing. And the police officer looked at me and said, you want to get in the back and warm up? I went, that's not the first time I've been in the back of a police car, but it's the first time I haven't been arrested. So I thought it was kind of a cool thing. So I sat in the back of the car and I'm just sitting there and the weight of the day is just overwhelming me. I, I had watched a mother covered in her daughter's blood. I had to pray over her. I had to go to the hospital and check on her husband that had been wounded and tell him that his two daughters were dead. It's a bad day. I know what midnight feels like. I've lived at midnight. And if you've never been to midnight, you know how dark and hopeless it feels. I remember looking at one of my pastors that were with me there and I said, well, I know now why I was called to New Life Church. I'm a, I guess I'm a hospice pastor here to give a once great church a good death and a good funeral. Because I just didn't see any hope from any of that. I just thought this is the end of our church. It will never be the same. So about three days later, I called for a prayer meeting at our church and I said, you know, we just need to get together and pray. I don't have a sermon to heal any of this. We were still in trauma and we were overwhelmed with trauma and grief for years, quite honestly. I said, but we need to gather. The only thing I know to do is call upon the name of the Lord and it's best if we do this together. And to my surprise, 6,000 people showed up and packed the auditorium, standing room only. People were there. They were leaning in. And we began to sing this song, Overcome. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We will overcome. And we sang the song. And when they sang it again, and then we sang it again because we didn't know what else to sing. And here's what I saw. In the middle of that song, while living at midnight, I saw my people's shoulders kind of square. I saw they began to lift their head. And here's the Lord said, I'm giving your people a holy defiance. That wasn't because they were angry. It's because they were full of faith. Listen, the, the world doesn't need an angry church right now. The world needs a worshiping church. We need the weapons our, of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. For the pulling down of strongholds. And the church has always found itself in fights using weapons that no one else uses. What is our weapons? Our weapons are prayer and worship and love. The, the, that's, that's, it's, it's counterintuitive, I know. But it has been a revolutionary force that's changed the earth for 2,000 years. We need to call upon the name of the Lord. And listen, here we are 16 years later. A few weekends ago, we baptized 362 people on a single weekend. In one weekend. In, in, crazy, in crazy liberal Colorado, we're seeing a breakout of the Holy Spirit. Revival. That's the most baptisms in the 38-year history of our church in one weekend. Three different women who all confessed to me that they were practicing witches, baptized, came out of the baptismal tank sobbing and weeping, shaking and crying, radical salvations. People that were way deep in the darkness are coming to salvation. And this is happening all over the United States right now. We're seeing revival break out and it wants, it's going to happen here as well. But listen, what I'm, tell, I'm telling you that not to brag on numbers. I'm not here to impress you with numbers. I'm here to tell you that I know what it feels like to live at midnight, but also know what it means to worship until the morning comes. Amen. And I'm living now in the daylight. It doesn't feel overwhelming. It doesn't feel dark anymore but I worship my way through the valley of the shadow of death. Some of you just need to worship with me today. Would you stand with me this morning? And I'm gonna ask the altar team, those of you who pray down at the altars to come on down. We're gonna go back into this song and if you're here today and you're living at midnight, 
There's just, just something part of your life is broken. First of all, let's just turn our hands toward the Lord for a moment. I'm, I'm going to decide to do this today. I decide today to worship. In spite of the evidence in front of me, I'm going to worship and call for the, a new reality. For heaven to come. For his kingdom to come. His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Father, I pray over my brothers and my sisters today. I pray that the Holy Spirit would just overwhelm them and overshadow them today, that you would settle upon their soul, that you would do holy work in their lives. I pray that you would do miracles in their lives and hearts and minds today as they worship. And we thank you today that you're for us and not against us, that we're in the palm of your hand and no power of hell and no scheme of man can take us from the palm of your hand. I thank you today that these are sons and daughters that have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. They belong to you. And we lift our hands today to worship and to call on your name. And we pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Come on, let's worship together. If you need prayer, step out right now.